you're visiting Grace Community Church this morning, welcome. Uh, as Crystal said on Wednesday night, it really truly was at one point more people here that we didn't know than, than we did know. And so I love that. I love that we have the community uh, coming and being part. Okay, so a few weeks ago, before we moved here, I started a series called How to Not Ruin Your Life. And it's based out of Proverbs chapter 22. Uh, verses 17 through Proverbs 24, verses 30. And I told you then I was going to be reading through the Good News Bible. And so uh, while I typically read out of New King James, uh, study out of New King James, this uh, particular series uh, is uh, coming from the Good News version of the Bible. So I'll be reading that version. It's probably not one you're familiar with. Um, these are 30 wise sayings from King Solomon. And the wisest people around. If you recall, Solomon wrote Proverbs chapter 1 through Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17. And then he and some really wise guys uh, got together and wrote verse, chapter 22, verse 17 through chapter 24, verse 30. He then wrote chapter 25 through 29. And then two other guys wrote chapter 30 and 31. I share that with you because I think it's important to know who is uh, ascribing... Uh, who we ascribe the content to. It's King Solomon uh, is named as one of the wisest guys ever. Um, it's pretty incredible. I mean, there's a lot of wise people who have gone through history. Um, I have some favorites of my own. Uh, I won't name because if they're not your favorites, you may not like me anymore. Um, but, you know, one, I'll just name one because I think everybody likes Abraham Lincoln. Um, and if you don't, I... I probably shouldn't be friends with him. I don't know. Uh, no, really, he, what he, the wisdom he had as he navigated changing our country and the, and the future of our country to be where we're at today. The Lord gave him wisdom, but as, as wise as Abraham Lincoln was and how he, he ran our country and how he led, King Solomon is, is said to have been the wisest man ever. And so with that, I think it's important to, to take the wisdom that he, he is sending to us, that he's giving to us, uh, if you recall, Solomon wrote Proverbs so that he could equip his sons and he could equip future generations, which is us, and how to be successful in our life. And so uh, we went through the first four a couple of weeks ago. Don't take advantage of the poor. Um, that's a pretty good wise saying. Don't take advantage of the poor. Don't hang out with angry people. Um, yeah, don't hang out with angry Are you angry? If you're angry, I can't hang out with you. But if you're not angry, we're going to go to lunch afterwards. Anywhere, you know, we can go to lunch and hang out. Um, don't co-sign on loans and don't move the boundaries. For the sake of time, I'm not going to re-preach those this morning. Uh, but if you ever want to go back and figure out what I had to say about those, you can get the messages there online. So today we'll start in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. And it says, we're having lots of technical Talk loud. I'm going to turn this back on. Or I'm going to do this. Third time's charm. If you guys don't want me to preach, I mean, I know I went long last week, but you got an extra hour of sleep, so that means I get, I, we should be fine, right? Uh, just for the sake of saying it, can we verify this is going through the feed? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pray because this is just a train wreck at this yeah. moment. <laughs> Lord, I thank you that you have something that you want to do this morning. I thank you that we're not here to hear me speak. We're not here to have this worship team lead us in worship. We're not here for the kids' classes to have crafts and snacks and lessons. Lord, the real reason why we're here is to give you glory. Yes. The reason why we're here is for your Holy Spirit to minister to us, to speak to us, to correct us, maybe to rebuke us, to encourage us. Lord, we're here so that you would have your way in our lives and that we would grow closer to you. We would become more like you, that our, our journey on the sanctification process would continue instead of being halted. Lord, I pray that this morning as we navigate uh, our time together, that, that that would be the case for every person in this room. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. Show me someone who does a good job, and I will show you someone who's better than most and worthy of the company of kings. 
So with each of these uh, 30 things, I, I'm going to boil them down to one statement, which today for the first one is do excellent work. Uh, we're called to be people of integrity. Integrity by definition means adherence to moral and ethical principles, a sound, unimpaired, or perfect condition. My definition is this. It's what you do or what you think when no one else is around, when no one else will notice. So um, Guido, uh, what, what he does with the PGBG when he's not getting credit, uh, when nobody's giving him $500, when the mayor's not showing up, is he still invested and is he still giving it everything he has? Or does he only do that when the mayor is going to show up or people from the church are going to show up? See, integrity is how we live our lives when, when nobody else is watching. And what Solomon is saying here is do your excellent work. Because when you do your excellent work, when you do hard work, when you do good work, that's, that says something about you. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Wives... Submit to your husbands, for that is what you should do as Christians. By the way, I'm still reading from good news. Um, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, it's your Christian duty to obey your parents always, for that is what pleases God. Parents, do not irritate your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in all things, not only when they are watching you because you want to gain their approval, but do it with a sincere heart because of your reverence for the Lord. By the way, um, yes, they did, unfortunately, deal with slaves in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. You, you read that word. For us today, it obviously doesn't apply the word slaves. The, the best correlation to the word slaves today is we work for people. We have bosses that employ us. And so when you read the word slave, I don't want to diminish or take away from the fact that they actually were slaves. But you're not a slave today. I mean, you're a slave to sin, is what Scripture says, or you're a slave to the Lord. We get to choose that. But when talking about the authority that we're, that's referenced here, when it says slaves obey your human masters, it would be just as easy to say, hey, uh, employees, listen to your bosses. You need to serve them the way that God's asking you to serve them, not only when they are watching you because you want to gain their approval, but do it with a sincere heart because of your reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for human beings. Verse 24 says, remember that the Lord will give you as a reward what he has kept for his people. For Christ is the real master you serve. And wrongdoers will be repaid for the wrong things they do because God judges everyone by the same standard. Each of these descriptions, each illustration listed here in Colossians is an example of some form of authority and those under authority. And here's how Paul concludes it. He says, whatever you do, work with all your heart. Now, I don't know about you. Um, how many like to watch football? I mean, some of you like to watch football. If you're in for the Packers, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just You're getting all kinds of shout-outs today. I hate the Packers. Um, no, have you ever... Have you ever thought about or have you, have you considered when, when you're your wide receiver for your team, whether it's the Cowboys or the Bears, I mean, you know, because the Bears are, are pretty good, whatever team you root for, have you ever seen your wide receivers take plays off? Like they know they're not going to get the ball thrown to them, so they don't run very hard. They don't run the route as thorough as they would. They don't run as fast. They don't want to exert the energy that they would normally have exerted if potentially the pass was coming to them. Well, here's what Paul's saying. Work with all your heart. You run every play as if you might get the pass thrown to you. Too often we think we're just gonna we're just gonna kind of coast. We're just gonna kind of I mean we're just gonna kind of not give everything we have. And the fact is. You're called to give everything you have in all the time. It says, as though it were for the Lord and not for humans. I know that if Jesus was standing right here and asked you to do something, you'd be like, yeah, let's go do it. Game on. I'm going to give everything I have. But when your parents ask you to do it or your boss asks you to do it or your husband or your wife asks you to do it, maybe we don't give the same kind of effort. And what Paul is teaching us is, Whatever the form of authority, do it unto the Lord. Don't do it unto 
human beings. And it says in verse 24, which is awesome, the Lord will give you the reward. I don't know about you. Your paycheck's not your reward. The attaboy, the I love you, the whatever it is that you're seeking in, in the form of authority that we're talking about, whether it's from your, your husband, your wife, your parents, your kids, your boss, that's not the reward. And if you're doing it for that reward, they'll fail you. Christ is the real master. We're doing it unto the Lord. So these guys in this particular saying, uh, get it right because God is the judge and he's always watching. Not only will our good and excellent work be noticed by those who are in authority over us, but by those in heaven. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You don't have to post everything on social media. It's fun. We like the, the likes or the hearts or whatever, depending on your particular form. But that's not why we're doing it. If you're doing it for that, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. We're doing it to serve the Lord. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Show me someone who does a good job, and I will show you someone who's better than most and worthy of the company of kings. I want to I be worthy of the king of kings. Uh, I'm going to skip that next verse, uh, and I'm going to go to number two. Do not be blinded by glitz and glamour. So the second thing today is don't be blinded by glitz and glamour. You know what? Everything that glitters is not gold. Proverbs 23, verse 1 says, When you sit down to eat with someone important, keep in mind who he is. If you have a big appetite, restrain yourself. Don't be greedy for the fine food he serves. He may be trying to trick you. Okay, so I, I'm reading these, these wise sayings, and they don't necessarily all apply in the context. Is there a problem with this one? Yeah, it's worth the Service. We're really time. usually better than this. If you're visiting with us, be patient. Come back next week. Uh, it, it, we won't have these. Th we won't have all these technical these technical problems. It is. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's easy to be blinded when things are going well. I, I, this this passage of scripture: when you sit down to eat with someone important, keep in mind who he is. If you have a big appetite, restrain yourself. Don't be greedy for the fine food he serves. He may be trying to trick you. It's easy to be blinded when things are going well. We can be blinded by people's character. We can be blinded by their motives. We can be blinded by their end goals. When we happen upon a situation where we're being treated very well, and it's out of the norm, don't let the luxury lead you astray. Have you ever been invited to something and you have no idea how you got there? Like, what is the reason why you're there? What is the reason why you've been included? What happens when you when you get to that place? You want me to switch? <coughs> Strike three. Oh, no. James says this in James chapter two. My brothers and sisters, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. Suppose a rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes to your meeting and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat here, but say to the poor man, stand over there or sit here on the floor by my feet, then you are guilty of creating distinctions among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. As a church, when we were located in Southlake, uh, people around, uh, especially our district, knew we were a Southlake church. And as a result, they thought we were well-to-do because Southlake is a well-to-do community. Not everybody. Um, they have free and reduced lunch programs in Carroll ISD, just like they do in Keller ISD and Fort Worth ISD. But because we were from a community that was considered to be affluent, we were considered to be an affluent church. They didn't know we didn't have the affluent people from Southlake attending <laughs> our church. As a result, though, we were treated different. We were treated different in the district. Uh, we, have, we had people call us. Or you think people called every day, every other day? I mean, it was a lot. How often do you think people called asking for handouts? Three times a week. Three times a week? A few times a week. A few yeah. times a week. Um, I, I, up until this morning, we hadn't had anybody call since we've been here. We did get somebody this morning who called. Actually, they called and left a voicemail. 
that's kind of the the reverse of what we're talking about as far as because we were considered to be affluent, people would come and ask and, and they would have expectation of us. When when we have opportunity to be with people that are of significance or of importance, how we respond to them, it changes everything. People responded to us, they thought we were special, they thought we had lots of money, they thought we could meet all of their needs. We do the same thing with people. We shouldn't be blinded by what things appear to be. We should not be swayed by anything except the Lord. We have to remember that God looks at the heart and not our outward appearance. I often think of how Samuel wanted to choose all six of David's brothers or all seven of David's brothers. He didn't want to choose David. He didn't even know David existed. But he went and he said, Oh, certainly this brother is the one he's big and he's tall and he's strong. He looked like me. Um, <laughs> you are out there. I'm glad you're out there. This one is working. I'm, I'm surprised. Good night. God looks at our heart and our outward appearance. We see it clearly in the book of Acts when Peter goes to Cornelius. Cornelius is not a Jew. He's somebody who is Making alms to the Lord is how he's described. He's continuing to bring his requests to the Lord. And in verse 34, Peter began to speak. I now realize that it's true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Those who worship him and do what is right are acceptable to him, no matter what race they belong to. It's just a few chapters later, Peter's rebuked because he's now treating the Gentiles differently. Paul comes in and and he kind of gets on to him because Peter won't now live with or act with or eat with the Gentiles. What Solomon is attempting to do here today and for number two is don't be blinded by the things that are around you. Ask the Lord to show you the heart. Ask him to reveal your heart. The third thing today, so don't do, first is do excellent work. Second is don't be blind, blinded. Blinded by the glitz and the glamour. The third is, money's not the answer. Proverbs twenty-three, verse four: Be wise enough to wear yourself not. Be wise enough not to wear yourself out trying to get rich. Your money can be gone in a flash, as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. It's pretty self-explanatory, but a corresponding scripture for the New Testament would be Mark eight. Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. If anyone wants to come with me, he told them, he must forget self, carry his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Do people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. There's nothing they can give to regain their life. If a person is ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory his father with the holy angels. Jesus is explaining to us where our focus needs to be. He's reminding us that the most important thing is that we would die to ourselves, that we would make his plan, his call, the most important area of our life, that we would not focus on the things that don't matter, but focus on the things that do matter. When we give up ourselves for him, we actually gain everything. And I know that's counterintuitive. Giving up everything doesn't make sense. I've had a lot of people ask me, well, why are you moving from South Lake over here to Fort Worth? It doesn't make sense. That building's bigger. The building was uh, uh, in, in better condition as far as physically the, the look of it. And the answer is it's what the Lord's told us to do. He's, he's brought us here because he has a plan for us in this community. He's brought us here because he's got a plan for you in this community. Can I remind you that the Lord's expectation of you is that you would worship him and you would acknowledge him where you live and where you work and where you worship. So this is now part of your community. Heritage Elementary. The high school right here. The, the junior high right up the road or middle school. I don't know if they what they call it in, in Keller if it's junior high or middle. God's opening doors for you to influence. And can I tell you something? Sometimes we have to give up everything in order to get everything. Matthew 6 says, don't store up riches for yourself here on earth. 
where moth and rust destroy, and robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches for yourselves in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and robbers cannot break in and steal. For your heart will always be where your riches are. Where are you investing? What are you giving towards? The last thing today is seek the real bread of life. Proverbs 22, 23, verse 6. Don't eat at the table of a stingy person or be greedy for the fine food he serves. Come and have some more, he says. But he doesn't mean it. What he thinks is, what he really is, you will vomit up what you have eaten and your flattery will be wasted. Don't waste your time on people that really can't provide what's needed. When we're looking for provision, we should not seek it from those who are stingy, who are known as misers. Even if they give it to you, their hearts are not with you. When their heart is exposed, it says it will make you sick to your stomach and you will realize you've wasted your time. John 6 says this, they replied, what miracle will you perform so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, just as the scripture says, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus said, what Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven. It is my father who gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread that God gives is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they asked him, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. You see, what I believe Solomon is saying is when we seek God and his provision, instead of provision from man, we'll never be without. You know what? I, I, I'm not wealthy, although I'm wealthy. In case you're wondering, you're wealthy. You may not be wealthy from an American standpoint, but if you go around the rest of the world, you are wealthy. All of my needs have always been met because I'm seeking the Lord. It doesn't mean we've had everything that we've wanted. You know, there's a difference. But we've had everything we've needed. I've never been on the street. Even when I didn't have a house, my parents would stay with them. God is... He's faithful to meet all of our needs when we seek him for our daily bread. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As the scripture says, he gives generously to the needy. His kindness lasts forever. Listen to what it says here. And God who supplies seed to sow and bread to eat will also supply you with all the seed you need and will make it grow and produce a rich harvest for your generosity. He will always make you rich enough be generous at all times. Listen to what he just said there. He will always make you rich enough to be generous at all times. So that many will thank God for your gifts which they receive from us. For this service you perform not only meets the needs of God's people, but also produces an outpouring of the gratitude to God. And because of the proof which the service of yours brings, many will give glory to God for your loyalty to the gospel of Christ. Which you profess... And for your generosity is sharing with them and everyone else. So with deep affection, they will pray for you because of the extraordinary grace God has shown you. Let us thank God for his priceless gift. Okay, we've already received the offering. So this isn't about getting you to give right now. But can I tell you something? It is so important to give. Not just in the offering. I'm not talking about passing the baskets. I mean, that's, that's part of it. I'm talking about what needs do you know about that God wants to use you to go and meet? Who Don't raise your hand. Who wants to help pay for the 52 Thanksgiving dinners we're going to provide for this school next door? Like that's a need. That's an opportunity to give. That's an opportunity for God to get the glory because you see, he's given you enough so that you can give. He's made you rich enough so you can give. Don't be the miser that is unwilling to give. Be the person who gives generously because it gives God glory every time we do. It says our giving meets the needs of God's people but also produces gratitude to the Lord. What an incredible promise. 
What an incredible strategy of the Lord. I'm going to make you, Jason, rich enough to give away. And when you give away, you're going to meet the need of whoever's, whoever is in need. And you're going to give God glory. And then they're going to give thanksgiving because you did it in the name of the Lord. That's his plan. And everybody in here has enough to give. Again, I'm not talking about passing the offering bucket. I'm talking about buying a bike for a kid. Or organizing the, the helmet people. I don't even know who they were. But they showed up and they gave helmets to every kid that needed a helmet. Or maybe it's, uh, like I said, taking care of Thanksgiving meals for families in need. When we, when we give, it's doing the very work of the Lord for him. Because he provided it for you. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Because it is one of those days. I see it on your face. You're laughing because you know it's true. You're being kind. I appreciate that. Let's acknowledge where we're at. Say it's okay. We're going to come back next week and do it again. Uh, everything's going to work right. And if it doesn't, you'd be praying for us. But before we go, I want to share the two words that were given to us for last week. That I didn't, I didn't share last week, and I said I would not show them this week. Second Chronicles chapter five verse thirteen. This isn't going to be on the screen, by the way. Second Chronicles chapter five verse thirteen says this: Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanksgiving. I'm sorry, in thanking the Lord. And then we lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, "For He is good." For his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. My dad sent that passage of scripture, and it's when the temple was being dedicated in Second Chronicles, and Solomon actually is is the one who's dedicating the temple. And what is the crux of this is that we would come into here in unity and give the Lord thanks, and His presence would dwell here. I think it's so important that when we gather, it would be to give him thanks. It's, it's not for the sound system to work. It's not for worship to be awesome. It's not for the message to be the, the most best. There's good grammar for you for Manuela. Um, it's not to be the most incredible message you've ever heard. Although we always hope that everything goes that way. The reason why we're here is to give God thanks. The, the word that Andy gave me was this, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. We'll fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he will become a glory, glorious throne to his father's house. God has placed an authority on us. Not just me, not just our staff, not just our leadership. On you, and he is opening doors now that no man can shut, and he's closing doors that no man can open. Can I tell you that I am excited about what God is doing? It, it was with excitement and anticipation that I shared with you the the text message from the principal. What's happening with PGBG? What's happening all around us? God is giving us an authority and He's opening doors as we give Him thanks, as we take the authority He's given to us. It's going to be incredible what God's going to do. And I'm going to close with this. I read this last week. I'm actually really strongly considering closing every service every week with this. I haven't decided yet, but you'll, you'll, you'll have a heads up in case I do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, Remember, we're talking about you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Lord, I don't know in what way I need to humble myself at the moment. But if there's anything that is being led from a position of arrogance or pride, I want to humble myself before you. I want to turn from my wicked ways. If there's sin in my life, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. The things that intentionally I did or the things that I, I did unintentionally that I didn't even know were sin, I ask that you would forgive me. Lord, I pray that 
this congregation, everybody who hears this, would live from a position of humility, would live from a position of, of repentance. Lord, I, I've preached before and I mean it. Repentance is not about uh, the, the request for forgiveness. It's about posturing myself in a place and a position of of humility before you because you've already forgiven me. That's what your word declares. You died on the cross one time. One time your blood was shed so that I would be forgiven. So repentance is not about trying to make sure that I get my, my place in heaven. It's about humbling myself before you. And so Lord, this morning, I want to be one of your people who is indeed called by your name, who has humbled themselves, who is turning from his wicked ways, because then I will hear from heaven. Then you will forgive our sin. Then you will heal this land. Lord, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive. And your eyes will be open and your ears will be attentive to the prayers that we make. Lord, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for sanctifying this place. Help us to make your name famous. Help us to glorify you in all that we do. Help us to give thanks for who you are. You've sanctified this place. You've sanctified this body and you've sanctified this place. Thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, listen, this Wednesday night, we have Miguel Gonzalez from Havana. Uh, please come here. We're gonna we're just gonna kind of have a conversation about what's happening in, in Cuba. And I would love for you to come here and, and, and see what's happening down there. Uh, youth will have their first youth service this Wednesday night in the new building. So if you have a teenager, bring them. Have a great week, everybody. Be blessed. <laughs>